Hello to everyone. My name is Ladislav Nodi and I will chair this uh, session. Uh, welcome to the uh, Working Group 2 uh, meeting. As you know, the Working Group 2 of this uh, AtoChem chemistry cost uh, action deals with the theoretical aspects of uh, attosecond chemistry and physics. We will have uh, uh, four speakers uh, in uh, our session. Uh, Alberto Castro, Aurora Ponzi, uh, Zdeniek Maschin, and Federico uh, Marquesin. Uh, each speaker will have uh, uh, 25 uh, minutes for the speech, and uh, uh, we will have uh, five minutes for questions and answers. If you want to uh, uh, put questions, uh, please uh, uh, write uh, on the right hand side of your screen in the questions and answers. Uh, uh, place of the screen. Okay, so uh, our first uh, speaker is uh, Alberto Castro, and uh, well, he will talk about uh, rm first molecular dynamics with time-dependent density functional theory in and out of equilibrium. So, Alberto, please take the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, share the screen. Okay, uh, so thank you uh, and uh, big thanks also to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Um, I will be talking today about uh, RFS molecular dynamics. Um, RFS molecular dynamics is one of the various methods that exist to deal with uh, hybrid quantum classical systems, that is uh, systems that combine both uh, classical particles, typically the nuclei, with uh, quantum particles, uh, typically the, the electrons. Um, now, my, my talk uh, is going to be to have two parts. Uh, it's going to be rather theoretical. Um, and in fact, the first half is a little bit off topic in this uh, workshop about uh, ultra fast to second dynamics, because it is going to be about uh, equilibrium, um, uh, thermodynamic equilibrium. Um, However, I feel that this is, a, this is a, maybe a topic of, of fundamental interest for any uh, uh, physicist or, or chemist, um, and therefore I hope that uh, you find it interesting too. Um, and then on the second part of the, of the talk, I will discuss out equilibrium uh, phenomena um, uh, dealt with, with uh, RFS dynamics and, and TDFT, in particular the combination of opti optimal control theory with, with these techniques. Uh, so let me get started by recalling what RFS dynamics is. Uh, so the RFS dynamics is the hybrid quantum classical dynamics that derives naturally from the full Schrodinger equation uh, for a set of nuclei and electrons. And this can be uh, very cleanly and nicely derived um, by considering two, two uh, consecutive steps. Uh, the first one would be wave packet separation uh, that leads to the so-called time-dependent self-consistent field method although it, it sometimes receives other names. Uh, so if you have um, the, the, uh, the full Schrodinger equation for, for all, the, all the nuclei, capital R, and all the electrons, small r, and then you make these ansatz, these, these factorization ansatz for the full wave function into a, a, a nuclear wave packet and an electronic wave packet, uh, you end up with this set of coupled equations, uh, one uh, Schrodinger-like equation for the for the uh, nuclei, one Schrodinger-like equation for the electrons, and, and they are coupled because the Hamiltonian of each depends on the wave function of the other part of the system. The second step that you need to do uh, is uh, the classical, to take the classical limiter for the nuclei, which is typically done uh, with the so-called short wave asymptotics, sometimes also called WKB scheme. Um, and it consists of, 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 of uh, assuming, once again, uh, these ansatz for, for the wave function in terms of an amplitude and a phase. Uh, and then you take a small uh, parameter in, in that, that uh, is, is the, the ratio of the masses between the small and the, and the, and the let's say, the light and the heavy particles. And then if you take this, this, um, this small parameter 10 to 0, you end up with RFS uh, equations, which are these equations that I wrote here in a very simplified uh, way. Uh, so it is a set of combined, of, of, of coupled equations, a set of uh, Hamiltonian-like equations for the movement of the nuclei, so the, the, the velocities and the, and the momenta of the nuclei, um, 
that evolve according to this Hamiltonian function that that depends on the on the on the um, um, electronic wave packet, right? And then for the electrons, you have a Schrodinger-like equation that uh, whose Hamiltonian depends parametrically on the position and on the on the uh, momenta of the of the nuclei. Um, so uh, I think it is a nice thing that uh, RFS dynamics um, can be derived in such a clean and evident way from the from the um, full Schrodinger equation because it, it helps to clarify when and why uh, the method may be uh, may be uh, correct or not, um, which cannot be said of, of other uh, hybrid quantum classical uh, schemes. Um, now, there's a second reason that I like RFS dynamics, um, and it is the fact that RFS dynamics is a Hamiltonian system, and that makes it belong to the same category that many uh, fundamental theories in physics. So, Newton's equations are a, a Hamiltonian system. Uh, Schrodinger equation is, in fact, a Hamiltonian system. Maxwell's equations are can be written in the form of a Hamiltonian system. Uh, and therefore, it makes a lot of sense, in my opinion, to, to, to think that uh, uh, whatever theory we use for hybrid quantum classical system, it, it would be nice if it is also a Hamiltonian system. Now, now uh, it is not such a well-known fact that uh, Schrodinger equation is actually a, a, a Hamiltonian system. So let's recall how, how easy it is to understand this. Uh, so if you consider a, a quantum system given by, by any quantum system given by its Schrodinger equation, uh, you write it in terms of an orthonormal basis. Um, so you write it in matrix form um, for the, the matrix form for the coefficients of this wave function in terms of the orthonormal basis. And then if you define a set of, 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 of variables q and p as the real and imaginary part of the coefficients, then it, you, one can easily prove that Schrodinger's equation is entirely equivalent to this set of equations, and you recognize here the Hamiltonian set of equations, where the Hamiltonian function is given by the expectation value of the Hamiltonian operator uh, for uh, the, the wave function determined by the Q and P variables that are defined here. So Schrodinger uh, equation is a classical in quotation mark uh, Hamiltonian system. Um, so it would be nice if Ehrenfeld's equation is one, two. And in fact, this is the case. And, and to see that, it is good uh, to move to the Poisson bracket formulation of, of, of um, uh, classical dynamics. Uh, and that you can do for Schrodinger equation in this form. You group the Q and P variables into this uh, eta combined variable. And then you define the, the, the Poisson bracket in the usual way um, that is done when you study uh, classical dynamics. Um, and then, it, once again, Schrodinger's equation is entirely equivalent to the Hamiltonian equations of motion written in terms of the Poisson bracket. Uh, now, if you define a hybrid system, you, you can do it by combining a classical phase space and a quantum phase space. So the classical phase space would be given by the position and momenta variable of, uh, in this case, all your nuclei that we group with the, with the variable he. And then we define uh, the quantum phase space through the variables eta that I just defined above. Um, now, the observables in this in, in a hybrid theory will, in general, be uh, self-adjoint linear operators in the quantum Hilbert space. But the peculiarity of hybrid systems is that these, uh, these uh, operators, these observables, should depend uh, on the uh, uh, position in phase space, uh, in the classical phase space. Uh, now, you can define uh, functions in the full phase space by taking the, 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 the expectation values of, over the quantum wave functions. Uh, and you end up with real symmetric quadratic functions in 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 the in the quantum phase space. Uh, now uh, you can build Hamiltonian system by composition. So we have a classical bra bracket for 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 the, the uh, uh, classical Poisson bracket. We know what it is, and we just define a quantum bracket for the quantum part of the of the system. So if you define the sum of both, uh, um, this is a fundamental property of, of Poisson bracket theory that this Poisson bracket is a valid Poisson bracket. It verifies all the properties of the Poisson bracket uh, that I will not go into uh, details. Um, but it turns out that this definition leads to nothing else than LFS dynamics that you can write in abstract way like this, but then that, that you can rewrite in the way that I, that I did before. So this is the second nice thing, so to say, from a theoretical perspective of RFS dynamics. Um, now, a third thing that I like about RFS dynamics, and that is the reason that, 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 that let's say, for the applications part of this talk, is that it, it can be combined um, nicely 
with a density functional theory, in particular with time-dependent density functional theory, in order to handle the many electron part of the problem. Why is that? The reason is that the force can be written explicitly in terms of the electron density. So, in principle, the, the force, the derivative of the momentum of the nuclei, should be this expectation value. This would be a high dimensional integral over the full many electron uh, wave function, which would be difficult to compute. But for normal Hamiltonians, this can be written explicitly in terms of the time dependent density with a one integral, uh, one variable integral, right? Uh, well, the time dependent density is the central object of TDFT, and it is given by, by this equation. Uh, so this is the fact that permits to substitute the, the need to solve the many electron Schrodinger equation. So the Schrodinger the, the equation that we have here that can be very difficult to 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 deal with. Um, you can substitute it with the uh, set of one particle Consham equations used in DDFT that uh, I will I will write them explicitly a bit later. Okay, so we have uh, worked with this method in the past, and this is just uh, one example we did already. In, many years ago, so the combustion of, of acetylene, the, the collision of acetylene molecule with oxygen to, to form new molecules. In this case, the, the electrons are represented, represent, represented by the time-dependent electron localization function that, the, that you saw so here. It, but this is not the, 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 the topic that I want to discuss. Uh, let me move on to the, um, to the first part of, of um, my talk, which is a discussion about the equilibrium uh, the properties, or let's say that the correct definition of the uh, equilibrium ensembles for hybrid quantum classical systems, uh, and in particular how it, that relates to, to Ehrenfest dynamics. So, in principle, uh, an ensemble of hybrid quantum classical systems should be defined through a density matrix dependent on the classical variable. So you know that an ensemble for quantum systems is defined in terms of a density matrix, uh, that should be generalized for hybrid quantum classical systems, allowing for a dependence of the density matrix uh, on the classical uh, point in phase space. Uh, and then the, the normalization that you need is, is given here. Uh, now, when we started studying this, we were surprised to see that no one had bothered actually to, to, to work theoretically what should be the definition of the entropy of a hybrid quantum classical system. And in consequence, what is the maximization of the entropy uh, and, and therefore the definition of the uh, ensembles? In particular, what is the maximization of the entropy when you hold the energy, uh, the, the expectation value of the energy that would lead you to the canonical ensemble definition? Now, we have worked that out. Um, we think that this is the correct definition for the for the entropy of the hybrid uh, quantum classical system, and uh, we we prove that when you attempt the maximization entropy, um, the maximization of the entropy for a quantum uh, classical system, and you subject the expectation value of the of the of the Hamiltonian uh, to be one constant, you arrive to this definition of the hybrid quantum classical canonical ensemble where beta is the, is the temperature. Okay, so this this uh, is explained in this in this article right here, uh, and this should be general for any uh, hybrid quantum classical dynamics. This is not tied to RFS dynamics. This is this has been derived with no consideration to the to the explicit dynamics that the particles should follow. Um, so once you have the hybrid quantum uh, canonical ensemble, you can compute the ensemble averages, which are actually the objects that you typically want. And, and they would give, be given by, by this formula right here. The problem with this formula is that it may be very difficult to compute because this is a very multidimensional integral over all the classical variables. Okay, and then you also have to compute the trace, so you need all the all the uh, states in the in your quantum part. But this is a problem that was already found when doing uh, classical dynamics, right? Uh, the computation of, of, of the ensemble averages for a classical system of particles is complicated because you have many, many um, uh, variables. So one of the solutions is molecular dynamics. So how that, is that done in, in classical, in, in the purely classical case? Uh, so you also have a definition for the uh, classical canonical ensemble. Uh, this is just nothing else than the Boltzmann distribution. Um, you want to compute the ensemble averages, which will be given by this formula, the integral over the ensemble that you want to, to compute. And then you've uh, run into the problem of the very big dimensionality of this integral. And one possible solution is to do molecular dynamics. So you do not compute this integral directly in phase space, but you actually perform a, a, a dynamics, a trajectory in time of the system coupled to a thermostat. 
And then you assume the ergodic hypothesis that tells you that the, the ensemble average that you want to compute should be equal to the average over time of the uh, uh, observable that you are computing in the trajectory that you are following. So I'm using here the, the notation that theta is some thermostat, it can be whichever, uh, tuned to temperature beta. Okay. So could one do uh, the same with Ehrenfest dynamics and a thermostat? Well, it was found already many years ago um, that if you try to do that naively, actually that fails. And the reason is precisely that, as I, I just showed before, Ehrenfest dynamics is a Hamiltonian system. So this molecular dynamics plus thermostat method was invented for uh, uh, Hamiltonian systems, and it, it has been uh, it was invented and developed to produce the Boltzmann averages, which are let's say classical averages, even if you are using a hybrid quantum classical system. So that procedure would give you these averages, and these are wrong. These are not equal to the true uh, hybrid canonical ensemble average. And therefore, if you do uh, LFS dynamics with a, term, with a normal thermostat and you take naively the, 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 the um, average in time, as, as, as I show here, you wouldn't get the correct results. Um, this was known for a while, and it's, it's usually uh, mentioned as a, 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 a failure of RFS dynamics. Um, and while it is not nice that the RFS dynamics uh, cannot be used in this way, it's actually not a failure of RFS dynamics uh, because the same could be said also of Schrodinger equation. If you couple a thermostat to Schrodinger equation, uh, which is the correct equation, of course, uh, and then you perform uh, the same play, adding a thermostat and, and doing uh, uh, and computing the averages. Since Schrodinger equation is also Hamiltonian system, it would give you uh, the the uh, Gibbs uh, uh, ensemble averages, which are wrong in the case of quantum mechanics. Okay. Um, now, recently, we have found a way uh, to correct uh, this procedure. So, to do RFS molecular dynamics with a normal thermostat, but we have found how. You can, from that information, you can retrieve the correct ensemble averages um, by performing the, the, the averaging procedure in a different way uh, with this formula that I, that I showed here. In fact, one could do exactly the same thing with other correction formulas, um, uh, but for other forms of dynamics. Even if you do a ground state von Oppenheimer molecular dynamics, so in this case, the, the, the electrons are frozen to be in the, in the, in the ground state, but then if you apply a, a, a corrective formula that, of course, requires the computation of electronic excited states, you can use that information to get the true hybrid quantum classical ensemble averages. Okay, uh, so I am not showing results for this. Um, we will uh, publish them soon. Uh, but since uh, I wanted to also speak about out of the equilibrium processes, let me move on before I run out of time. Um, and let me uh, go over the, the topic of the uh, combination of optimal control theory and uh, RFS dynamics with the TDDFT as the electronic structure method. Okay, um, so uh, probably you uh, have heard already many times what optimal control is, but uh, let me uh, m uh, mention it very quickly in a nutshell, um, um, just in case. So the typical formulation of a general optimal control problem is given in this way. So suppose you have a dynamical system, which could be anything, could be Schrodinger's equation, could be Ehrenfest equations, could be whatever. Um, and then your dynamical function uh, depends on a set of parameters that you can control. That you can do. Typically, this will be uh, the, the, the shape, this would determine the shape of a laser pulse, for example, in, in photochemistry. Now, the problem of optimal control is formulated as the maximization of minimization of, of a, a cost functional. Uh, this cost functional is a functional of the system, and it can be a functional of the full evolution of the system, or more commonly, actually, or a functional of the final state of the system at the, at the end of the process T. So there's an objective that you got, want to, 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 to get, and then you have to, to, to formulate it to, to, um, uh, to write a functional whose maximization leads to the fulfillment of that objective. For example, the population of an excited state. Uh, you would write a function that would be the, the population of that excited, excited states in terms of the wave function. Um, now, since um, the specification of the, of the uh, control parameters determine the evolution of your system, the problem amounts to the maximization of a function, function G. 
that is given by, by the target function. So optimal control theory is the theory that is, is concerned with finding this optimal U and with related questions such as how stable is that solution for small variations of U or, or OF, what are the algorithms that one should use to do this maximization, um, is this value unique, uh, is, does it even exist, uh, etc., which is called controllability, so many, many other questions. Um, so what we did in the past was attempting to merge this, this control theory with TDFT. That, is, that means merging it with the, uh, the, a particular dynamical system, which is the time-dependent consumption system of equations that I wrote here and I mentioned, I mentioned before. So in TDFT, you substitute your interacting many electron problem by a, a fictitious non-interacting system of electrons um, uh, that nevertheless produce the same time-dependent density as the real one. Now, the evolution of this uh, fictitious system of electrons is given by the time-dependent consumption equations that I wrote here. So these are one-particle equations, and that's what makes this, this um, theory um, uh, easy to compute, uh, uh, that determine the evolution of each electron separately. Uh, and, and this here in between the brackets would be the, the Comsham Hamiltonian. Um, I will not go into, into details of what is here. The important point is that the, this will be the time-dependent density of the fictitious system, that it can be computed easily from, the, from each of the orbitals. Uh, but it is by construction in exact TDFT equal to the, to the exact time-dependent density. Of course, we do not have an exact TDFT. We have to make approximations. And therefore, uh, the, the time-dependent density that we get will be approximated too. Um, OK. So, as before, the objective is to maximize some function g of the control parameters u, defined in terms of a, term of a functional of the density. Since we work with TDFT, uh, ideally, we should define our target functional in terms of the density, because that way we make sure that the maximization for the fictitious consumption system equals to the maximization for the real one. Um, now, uh, we worked out. Uh, this, this, this problem, in particular, the most important equations are the equations that give you the gradient of the of the target functional of the of the function g in terms of the of the um, parameters u. Now uh, I wrote here, I put here the equation I shouldn't have because I do not want to to go into it. The take-home message is that in order to compute this gradient, you need to propagate the time-dependent consumption system, and actually you need to propagate them twice. Once you need to propagate the true uh, consumption orbitals. And then you have to propagate uh, backwards some related objects that uh, here I wrote uh, in terms of, of the lambda. Uh, so these are the lambda um, um, co-state orbitals. They are typically called the co-state in optimal control literature. And the, 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 the equations of motion for the co-state are similar to the time-dependent consumption equations, but they are a bit more complicated numerically because they, they include an extra term that I here I wrote as k, that it is nonlinear. And, and for those of you who have ever worked or, or read about time-dependent hartree fock the cost of application of, of, of this extra term is similar to, to time-dependent hartree fock So that makes it a bit more complicated than the, the solution of the time-dependent consumption equations. Um, now, this is the combination of, of uh, uh, OCT and TDFT. But remember that what I'm discussing is the combination of OCT with the, the combination itself of, of of uh, TDFT and RFS dynamics. So the questions that result of that are even more complicated. Uh, so I, I didn't put them here. They are very ugly. Uh, they are, they are um, um, shown and, and demonstrated in this, in this work here. Um, but the, the, what I have put here is, the, let's say, explicitly the, the dynamical system, so the, 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 the RFS molecular dynamics based on TDFT. Okay, so you have the time-dependent consumption equations that I wrote here. Uh, this would be the time-dependent density. Uh, this would be the, the consumption Hamiltonian that I wrote here explicitly. Uh, normally, your control parameters are the ones that determine the shape of the laser field that in this case uh, is taken in the dipole approximation. So this is the, the, the object that we typically use to control uh, our problems. Uh, and then the forces uh, on, the, on, the, on the ions that permit to evolve simultaneously the, the classical part of the, of the system are, are given here. Okay? So on top of this model, one has to build optimal control theory. And that's what we did. Um, so here I will show you a couple of results. Uh, in this case, the problem that we uh, wanted to, to look at is the controlled, or let's say, the selective photodissociation of the H3 plus uh, molecule 
So the idea was to, to take this molecule and, and to dissociate selectively one of the, of the nuclei, making sure that the others remain together, okay? So finding the laser pulse couple capable of doing that. Uh, so we defined our target function in this form. Uh, so the idea is to separate ion one from ion two. So we write explicitly the distance from these two ions. That's one thing we want to maximize. Also ion one from ion three. So this one from this one. And then we want to keep together uh, ion two from uh, and ion three because we want to keep this 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 H two molecule um, or H two plus molecule together. So we put the minus sign here. Seven femtosecond laser pulse, and then we add some constraints to the optimization in terms of the of the amplitude, of the highest amplitude or the highest intensity that we can have, and a cutoff energy for the for the for the laser pulse that we are using as control. And well, in the movie that has been running, you have seen how. Uh, the, 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 the ion leaves the system. And the important thing is that it, it is selective, the, the other two ions stay together. Uh, now, the second example I want to show before I finish uh, is the optimization of the Coulomb explosion of a metal cluster. So, you know, Coulomb explosion, it, it is defined as the fast, strong ionization followed by fast disintegration of the system. Now, in order to do Coulomb explosion, uh, the naive way would, would be to do to use resonant enhanced multiphoton ionization. So, tuning the laser pulse to some yeah, excitation. Okay, thank you. Um, the surface plus in, in case of a cluster, but this is not so trivial. Uh, you cannot use a, a monochromatic pulse because it has been shown um, both experimentally and theoretically that as the, as the electrons disappear, the resonance frequency blue shifts, and, and as the nucleus separate, the resonant uh, frequency red shifts. Uh, so what is the frequency that one should one use? So that's why we found this problem interesting for, for to probe our, our method. And also because the, sorry, uh, let me go back. The topic was explored with this model, with the RMFS molecular dynamics and TEFT model. And, and that's why we, we felt confident that the model was at least reasonably describing the, the scheme. And these are the results. So uh, let me stop the movies. Um, uh, we define the target in this case. So this is very simple. The idea is to produce as much ionization as possible. So to maximize the minus sign of the, of the total charge within the simulation box. Uh, we also set the total simulation time for the laser pulse. Uh, we added some constraints to the, to the frequency. And then we compare what we would get with a, with a monochromatic uh, pulse, or almost monochromatic pulse, tuned to the resonance plasma frequency of the cluster with a shaped pulse with optimal control. So on the right, we ha you have one case. On the left, we have the other. You can see how the shaped laser pulse very quickly disintegrates the, the, the cluster uh, because it takes the electrons very quickly away, whereas the, simply, uh, the, 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 the simple uh, resonant pulse with this intensity is not capable of, of disintegrating the, the cluster. So this was the, the final result I wanted to show. Very quick take home uh, messages or conclusions. Uh, the canonical equilibrium density matrix for a hybrid quantum classical system can be derived from the maximum entropy principle, um, which uh, had not been done before. Um, then it is known that RMFS dynamics cannot be naively used with a typical thermostat to yield canonical ensemble averages. But however, we have found that using either RFS or even ground state bone Oppenheimer molecular dynamics, but adding some correcting, correction factors to the, to the way that one performs the time average, one gets the correct ensemble average. And then I have shown how RFS molecular dynamics can be easily used with TDFT and how one can couple that model uh, with optimal control theory. And with this, I finish and uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, nice uh, speech. So probably I should stop sharing, right? Uh, yes. Yes, okay, thank you. I am uh, checking if there are some questions. I do not see any questions uh, here yet. Uh, till then I would like to uh, ask you uh, what is the advantage of your uh, method relative to the usual TDDFT? Well, no, no, I'm, I'm using I'm using uh, normal TDDFT. Uh, which part of the talks are your, the out of equilibrium, the equilibrium? Um, I'm using normal TDDFT. The only thing is that I'm coupling that with optimal control theory. 
Um, so for the resolution of the of the equations of motion, I use normal TDST, um, which all its problems and, and advantages, of course. Um, uh, so for for very high intensity phenomena, uh, it is known that it has uh, uh, it, it runs into a lot lots of trouble. Um, but at least, for example, for these uh, these uh, sodium clusters, we found in the literature that people had used them used them and got reasonable reasonable results. Uh, but we are not using any particular form of TDFT beyond the usual one. Okay, thank you. I still do not see uh, any uh, questions, so uh, thank you again for your uh, uh, nice presentation. Thanks. Okay. And uh, our uh, next speaker is uh, Aurora Ponzi, and uh, she will talk about gas phase molecules through the lens of photoelectron spectroscopy. Please, Aurora, take the thank floor. You. Thank you, Ladislaw. Uh, let's... Okay. okay, is it working now? Yes, it is okay. Yes, okay, perfect. So, uh, good morning to everyone. Um, I would like to present today my current work on gas phase molecules through the photoelectron spectroscopy. Uh, and in particular, this talk will focus on the photoemission processes involved in these, uh, these molecules. Uh, so I would like to uh, tentatively include my uh, current work and the today's presentation uh, in the first of the major objectives to be achieved within the uh, second work package of the cost action, uh, meaning the, uh, namely the uh, generation of a new set of computational methods to describe ionization of molecules with inclusion of electron correlation. And we know that electron correlation is essential to uh, understand X-ray spectroscopy. And we know that uh, it plays a crucial role in optosecond chemistry. Uh, in fact, it uh, drives the uh, ultrafast charge migration in molecules. Uh, and in general, it is responsible of strong signature uh, of the electronic structure uh, and the dynamics of molecules. So, uh, it is essential to take into account correlation effects uh, for a correct interpretation of spectroscopic signature. And photoelectron spectroscopy uh, is a powerful tool to uh, infer detailed information about the electronic structure of the target molecule, as well as on the properties of the ejected electrons, so the, the photoelectrons. Uh, also, it, is a, uh, it can be used as ultrafast probe in time-resolved experiments, so both in the uh, femto domain and in the uh, aptosecond domain, uh, and also in the description of many string field, um, of many string field phenomena. So uh, let's start with some uh, theoretical ingredients. The, uh, measurable, the measurable quantity in the photoionization process is the so-called differential cross-section. And from a theoretical point of view, uh, the mm, uh, main task is computing the object. So the uh, square module of the uh, dipole transition moment between the initial and the final states. And basically, the uh, methods of calculation differ on the choice of the bound states and on the uh, continuum states. And uh, let's say that uh, for the um, initial, um, for the calculation of the initial wave function, uh, this kind of calculation is quite straightforward in a sense that we can count on uh, standard methods of quantum, quantum chemistry and uh, quantum, um, quantum uh, mechanics. The, the problem is the calculation of the final wave function. This is the uh, bottleneck and it requires several approximations. Let's see uh, which approximation can be used. The first one is a single channel, single particle approximation. So uh, we can use at this level the uh, DFT method and basically the final wave function 
can be expressed as anti-symmetrized product between the ionic wave function and the electronic continuum wave function. Namely, we can express this final wave function as a monodeterminant in which the uh, height function is substituted by the electronic wave function. And at this level, we can describe a lot of uh, phenomena uh, and observables, namely the cross section and asymmetry parameters, as well as the uh, parameters that uh, uh, characterize the chiral molecules, so the uh, uh, dichroic parameters. And also we can describe um, resonances and in interference and diffraction effects appearing in the uh, cross-section profiles. Uh, and finally, we can describe photoionization from fixed in-space molecules, so uh, a molecular frame for the electron angular distribution. The second approximation uh, involves a uh, coupling of different channels. So we can use TDDFT uh, at this level. The final, uh, the final wave function in this case uh, can be expressed as sum of different products between the, the, fin the uh, ionic wave function and the electronic wave function. So at the end, we have this sum of different uh, determinants uh, that are uh, expanded with suitable coefficients. And uh, what is gained at uh, uh, this level, uh, we can describe correlation effects due to the mixing of single excited configurations. So we can describe the uh, channel mixing. And also we can take into account uh, interchannel coupling and uh, uh, autoionization resonances uh, due to uh, discrete single excitation. Uh, but still, we miss something important that is the uh, correlation due to uh, multiple excitations. Um, this means that uh, basically we cannot describe, for example, the appearance of uh, uh, satellite states, fake up states uh, in the uh, photoelectron spectra. Okay. The uh, third approximation uh, is a, a single channel approximation in which uh, we can describe the um, wave function of the bound states uh, with high co highly correlated method. And um, a way to, to do this is uh, using the so-called Dyson orbitals, that is a quite popular object in this moment, uh, and uh, uh, it's is basically the, super, the uh, superposition, the overlap between the ionic wave function and the neutral wave function. And in our methodology, uh, we uh, project the uh, ab initio molecular orbitals onto the disk line basis, so the uh, basis is uh, composed by uh, this line, and the Dyson orbital are expanded in this, uh, uh, in this basis. So basically, uh, the Dyson orbital is the um, this can be expressed uh, through this sum with uh, uh, suitable coefficients that derive from the overlap between the uh, ionic and the neutral wave functions. And this can be done uh, through, the, um, through a multi-configurational method. We uh, chose the complete axis space uh, self-consistent field method. Mm, but Dyson orbital can be expressed in different way, for example, also uh, in the couple cluster formalis, uh, where uh, we have to consider two different vectors, uh, namely the left uh, uh, Dyson orbital, the left vector, and the right vector. Um, and at this level of approximation, we are able to include, to describe basically all the correlation effects present in the bound state with a good accuracy. Uh, regarding the electronic continuum, the uh, continuum functions are contain, uh, are uh, obtain our methodology as a continuum solution of the Consham Hamiltonia, Hamiltonian that, it, that uh, is built from the DFT ground state density and this is the uh, this spline static exchange DFT method that has been uh, uh, developed over the years uh, by the group of um, Piero De Cleva. And now we have just implemented another um, uh, way to describe the uh, continuum, um, so the TDDFT 
the uh, continuum to take into account correlation in the uh, treatment of the continuum that it, um, uh, is, it cannot be considered in the uh, DFT framework. And uh, with this respect, I want to show you an example of uh, uh, how significant can be uh, the impact of the continuum treatment of the continuum treatment on the uh, final photoionization observable. Uh, so this is the case of the um, beta parameter uh, for the argon atom. Uh, we consider the ionization from the uh, 3p uh, orbital. And uh, um, the, the photoionization of argon is characterized by uh, a, a particular spectral feature uh, that appears uh, in the photoionization observables of argon, um, namely uh, we can observe this uh, minimum in the cross section and in the beta parameter that is known as Cooper minimum. Uh, in this figure, the dotted line correspond to the experimental result. The green line and the red line correspond to the theoretical calculation, respectively uh, to the uh, treatment of the bound state with the Dyson orbital for both the curve but we um, use different treatment of the continuum. So in one case, the green line uh, continuum has been calculated with the DFT and, for, uh, and the red curve uh, corresponds to the TDDFT treatment. And we can immediately see that DFT uh, lacks correlation in the treatment of the continuum, so basically uh, does not reproduce the minimum. Uh, that on the opposite can be uh, recovered at uh, uh, the FT uh, level, even if mm, there is a uh, dip of the minimum that is uh, overestimated by, by about one beta unit. Uh, so the, uh, <clears throat> the impact is, uh, uh, is huge and is, uh, is crucial. Another example of this can be seen studying another target molecule that is uh, uh, epichlorohydrin. Um, this, uh, this molecule was discovered by uh, a French scientist Berthelot during uh, a, a reactive experiment. And uh, it is a chiral molecule that, he, that generally exists as a racemic mixture uh, of right-handed and uh, left-handed enantiomers. And there are three different rotational isomers of these uh, molecules, so three conformers that are the uh, cis isomer, GOSH1 and uh, GOSH2, that is the most abundant one, uh, and, the, uh, and that is the isomer that, uh, uh, that we consider. So, uh, we studied the uh, outermost valence electron ionization of uh, epichloridrin, uh, in particular partial cross-sections and uh, beta parameters uh, have been measured by angle result for the electron spectroscopy with synchrotron radiation in the photon energy range from 13 to 54 electron volts. And this is the region where the uh, Cooper minimum appears. So <clears throat> we uh, studied the um, uh, Cooper minimum photoelectron dynamics uh, for uh, this target molecule, and this kind of dynamics has, has been extended to a, chiral, to a chiral system in a sense that uh, usually this, uh, um, this dynamics uh, uh, is studied for uh, symmetric molecules and not for chiral and uh, uh, molecules without symmetry. Um, also so uh, we studied the role of, uh, uh, of the electron correlation effects uh, in, the photo, in the final photoionization observables and in the pattern. Uh, these are the photoelectron spectra for epichloridrin, so different photoelectron spectra measured at uh, uh, different photon energies. And if we uh, take one of these uh, spectra, we can clearly see uh, the existence of two different well-separated bands, um, a, a group of bands at uh, low energy uh, and another group at higher energy. The, the first group of bands at low ionization energy um, uh, is formed by four cation electronic states. 
So we, we are considering four other most ionizations and the intrinsic difficulty uh, in the spectral description for this system is due to uh, two main issues that are the number of states within less than two electron volts and the uh, inadequacy of single particle picture. So basically the uh, breakdown of the single particle picture and of the uh, Koopman's theorem. These are the results that we uh, obtain for the um, asymmetry parameters. So we compare the experimental results with the uh, theoretical ones, and they uh, are characterized by uh, different dynamical behavior. In particular, we can see that uh, two of these channels, the uh, 22A orbital and the 23, uh, 23 a orbital present these uh, uh, characteristic oscillations in the uh, Cooper minimum region. And uh, as for the case of argon atom, we can observe that uh, uh, DFT lacks correlation in the treatment of the continuum. So the minimum is not around 47 electron volt, but it's uh, uh, between 30 and uh, 35 electron volt. Uh, in contrast of uh, TDDFT that can recover this uh, um, energetic difference, uh, even if uh, in one of these uh, channel we uh, again overestimated this, uh, this oscillation. Um, so the case is, uh, the, the, the kind of example is uh, the same as before, let's say, to stress the importance of description of the continuum. Okay, um, now uh, let's move to another chapter of this presentation, that is the chapter uh, concerning the appearance of uh, high energy oscillations in the photo, uh, photo ionization cross-section profiles. Uh, these oscillations are due uh, basically to, uh, to effects that are the uh, interference effects, so the uh, emission from equivalent center and the diffraction effects that uh, derive from the secondary waves uh, <coughs> scattered from inequivalent in centers and not from equivalent centers. Um, so the um, original idea of Cohen and Fano in 1966 uh, was that nuclei could act uh, as two center emitters. So, uh, basically, we can uh, consider, we can study the uh, interference in coherent emission as a microscopic analogy of the Young's double slit experiment. Um, we focus on the molecular orbitals that derive from the uh, carbon 2s orbital uh, that are um, well separated in energy energy that can be uh, experimentally resolved uh, in contrast to the um, core orbitals, so the uh, carbon 1s, uh, the deriving from the carbon 1s orbitals that cannot, uh, that cannot be uh, resolved. And um, we studied um, different hydrocarbons. Now I want to show you here uh, the results for the case of uh, propane, that is the uh, most simple uh, hydrocarbon. Uh, here, each carbon acts as a, a source of uh, coherent electrons. So uh, we are considering a um, three slit type uh, interference. Oscillations are clearly observed in the branching ratio uh, profiles, and these oscillations are a signature of the interference. Uh, if we now analyze the structure of the, mole the three molecular orbitals that we are uh, considering, we can see that the uh, 3A1 and the 4A1 are uh, delocalized over the whole molecule, uh, but the 4A1 has these two uh, nodes along the carbon-carbon bonds. And this leads to uh, oscillations in the um, branching ratio profiles, uh, profiles associated to these orbitals, roughly in antiphase. Uh, and uh, mm, this can reflect a kind of inversion of, of the symmetry. Uh, if we uh, now take into account the, um, the branching ratio profile for the 
2b2, we can, for the 2b2 orbital, we can observe a more regular pattern um, with a shorter period of oscillation that, that can be related uh, to the fact that the interference is dominated uh, by the two uh, more distant atom, uh, atoms, so uh, from the uh, two more distant centers that are the, uh, uh, the, uh, the two carbons, uh, um, the two carbons, yes. Okay, so there is a correlation between the distance between the emitted centers and the period that we observe uh, in, the, uh, in the oscillations in the, in the pattern, in the uh, uh, pattern of the profile. So uh, this uh, uh, oscillatory behavior uh, contain important uh, information on the uh, chemical physics, uh, for example, on the composition of the molecular orbitals. Okay, now uh, I want to okay, pass to uh, another uh, study. Um, this, uh, this is a, a study that we, um, that we published a couple of years ago. Uh, we studied the dynamics of the excited states uh, of, uh, of acetyl acetone. Um, so we follow the dynamics of the excited states of this molecule, and uh, uh, you can see here the photoelectron spectra uh, for uh, this molecule divided in two regions. One region uh, from uh, 8.5 electron volt to 11 electron volt is uh, the region of the photoionization from the ground state molecule. And uh, on the left, you can see the ionization from the uh, excited states. <clears throat> and here we can distinguish um, three uh, binding energy uh, at around uh, 4.5, around 6, and around uh, 7 uh, electron volt. And uh, um, okay, the, quest, the, the fact is that uh, if we observe serve uh, the, uh, these values on the base on uh, static calculation and on surface optic calculation, uh, we saw that uh, um, these uh, uh, values can correspond to different excitation uh, and, from and from ionization from uh, both planar and distorted geometry. So uh, one peak, for example, this peak at 6.04, can correspond to different transition and from mm, uh, different uh, uh, equilibrium, um, different geometries of the excited states. So the question is, uh, uh, is that a way to distinguish these excited states through uh, photoionization photo observable? So for example, from uh, molecular frame for the, for the electron angular distribution. Why molecular frame for the electron angular distribution? Because they are uh, highly characterizing uh, uh, signature of the, of the final states uh, and because they are particularly uh, sensitive to the nature of the final states that is embodied in our case uh, in the Dyson orbital uh, with, um, uh, that we use to describe the, the bound states. So uh, we did a preliminary study uh, in this direction and uh, we calculated the uh, molecular frame for the electron angular distribution for uh, the different binding energy. I'm showing you uh, the result for the binding energy uh, of 7.14 uh, electron volts that correspond to the kinetic energy uh, of uh, 12.09 for a particular, uh, for a um, given uh, axis uh, orientation of, of the field. So uh, in this slide, each column show different view of the same molecular frame for the electron angular distribution that is related to uh, two different transition. So we can follow the comparison along uh, each line and we can actually uh, appreciate some, uh, some differences, so uh, potentially we can distinguish uh, uh, through these uh, uh, observables the different excited states. Okay, uh, to conclude, I uh, tried to uh, stress the importance of the uh, 
correlation effects uh, together with the um, uh, treatment of the continuum. Uh, so these are two key factors to uh, accurately describe the photoionization observables. The observation of interference pattern due to the uh, coherent photoelectron emission from equivalent centers can provide important electronic and um, uh, geometrical information on the target molecules. So this is another uh, chapter of the story. And uh, finally, um, the calculation of the uh, molecular frame for the electron angular distribution profiles uh, can potentially differentiate excited states. Uh, and this methodology uh, can open the way to the possibility of a uh, clear discrimination in all the cases in which this kind of recognition and differentiation is uh, uh, tricky and uh, problematic, difficult. Okay, um, I'm concluding, uh, um, thanking all the collaborators and all the people that work on uh, this. So, uh, Piero De Cleva from the University of Trieste, Nadja Doslic and, Mar and Marin Sapunar, in particular for the uh, work on the acetylacetone. Stefano Stranges and Luca Schio uh, for the um, epichloridine, for, for the study on the uh, epichloridine molecule, and uh, Maria Novella Biancastelli, uh, both for the uh, study on the, uh, on the acetylacetone and uh, on the study of the interference and diffraction effects. And um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Aurora, for this uh, interesting talk. Uh, we have a question by uh, Gilbert Grell. Aurora, very interesting talk. Do you think that the TDD, uh, TDDFT uh, B spline continua could be used to describe the second ionization of an open shell cation? Uh, what steps would uh, have to be taken to make this possible, in your opinion? Uh, I, I would say that the problem is that with uh, uh, this D, uh, TDDFT, we are able to describe the uh, interchannel mixing deriving from the uh, primary uh, DFT states, meaning the, the states uh, deriving from the, ion the one particle ionization. So this is... Uh, um, this is the, an hybrid method, actually, because we can describe correctly all the correlation presence in the bound state, but for the continuum states, uh, uh, we can describe uh, only this level, so interchannel mixing. So uh, I, I don't think that we uh, could be able to describe uh, uh, this, that kind of ionization. I think that uh, we... Um, we need uh, a um, more complex uh, uh, modeling of the continuum, so a close coupling modeling, for example. Okay. I, uh, I do not see uh, more questions. Uh, maybe I would have uh, one related to uh, this one. Uh, uh, could you describe uh, correlation effects uh, in the continuum with more than two electrons in the continuum? With, or, sorry, uh, can you repeat? Not just one electron in the continuum. Uh, no, we are describing uh, uh, the mixing of uh, uh, different channels with one electron and one electron. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, thank you very much. Aurora for this talk. Thank you. And uh, the next talk will be given by uh, Daniel Maschin. Uh, he will talk about molecular R, R matrix uh, method as detailed probe of electronic dynamics in external fields and scattering. Please, the floor is yours. Okay. Hello. Um, Hello, I would like to start by thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present here and to show you uh, what it is that we can do with the molecular R matrix and what the latest developments are. 
Um, so in this talk, I will um, show you three things. Uh, first, I will show you how we can characterize uh, all resonances in scattering and photoionization that appear in our calculations. Um, um, the second point I'll make is that we can uh, now calculate exact two photon matrix elements for rapid time delays and two photon uh, above threshold cross-sections with the R matrix. And the third part will be devoted to strong field ionization of water, uh, where I'll show you uh, that the electron correlation plays uh, an important role. Um, the calculations that I'll describe were done um, using a combination of the time-independent R matrix and the time-dependent R matrix method. Uh, Andrew yesterday did a great job at covering the time-dependent R matrix in the context of the atomic calculations. Um, but uh, since the molecular um, codes are tightly integrated with the um, atomic, uh, formerly atomic codes, I will talk about the time independ independent R matrix too. Um, <clears throat> so obviously the codes that we are using are, uh, you know, are highly sophisticated and they have been developed over many years in various collaborations. In the last years, we have focused on um, the development of the molecular time-dependent R matrix. And this would not have been possible uh, without the uh, excellent collaboration with uh, our friends at Queen's University of Belfast uh, in the development that was set by Andrew Brown with all these people uh, contributing. And on the molecular side, there are uh, several established uh, collaborations um, so before I uh, basically launch into the R matrix uh, method, I will start by asking the question how uh, to identify resonances in computer data. Um, so what I'm showing you here in the, in the middle panel are the results of our calculations for electron scattering from pyrimidine. These are actually cross-sections for electron impact, electronic excitation of pyrimidine. So the black curve are our calculations, which feature several bumps and peaks, and the red are the experimental results. So you see that they match very nicely that the peaks that are result in the experiment also appear in our calculations. But there is a question on the origin of those peaks. So if you want to uh, be sure that those peaks are resonant, then typically you have to uh, do a series of calculations on different levels of approximation, look at different observables and so forth. Uh, but sometimes you are not sure, even if you do all these things. Uh, now, the second example is from photoionization. That's on the right-hand side. And here I'm showing you the beta parameters for photoionization of CO2 uh, into the various uh, ionic states of, of the molecule. And here you see the beta parameters in the left column as a function of photon energy. And on the, in the right-hand column, you see the corresponding cross-sections. And here again, you see that, for example, for the B state, there is a peak in the cross-section, but it's actually non-resonant. It's a non-set of P-wave uh, scattering. But in the C channel, you see that there is a, this uh, very large peak, which corresponds to the famous core excited shape resonance. So how do we resolve the question of how to identify unambiguously resonances in our data? Well, before I say how we do it, let me describe the R-matrix method a little bit. So now I'm focusing on the time independent R matrix method, which is a particular method for solving the Schrodinger equation. And the idea behind the R matrix method is based on the division of space. So imagine, for example, you have a photoionization uh, process. So in the photoionization process, in the initial stages, the electron is liberated from the molecule, but stays very close to the, uh, you know, to the ion. So in this region, all the electrons uh, interact very strongly and you have all the exchange processes and so forth. So it's a complicated multi-electron problem. So in the armatrix, in, the, in this region of space, which is uh, defined by the extent of the charge density of the target, we solve it by techniques which are similar to quantum chemistry, essentially configuration interaction. So, but then as the electron gets uh, uh, further away from the molecule, the problem becomes much simpler. It's essentially one electron scattering problem. The electron only feels some effective potential of the molecule that's left behind. Um, and so uh, we solve uh, 
the scattering uh, problem separately in each of these parts of space, and then we match the solutions on the R matrix sphere, which separates the inner region from the outer region. And the matching condition is provided by the R matrix, which provides the relation between the wave function amplitude and its derivative on the boundary. Now, the uh, very useful property of the R matrix is that it has an analytic dependence on energy, which allows us to calculate uh, observables very quickly for uh, very fine energy grids, for example. It also allows us to uh, push the energy into the complex plane. And that's something that we actually use uh, to uh, identify resonances and all kinds of other states in our calculations unambiguously. So just to uh, remind you, uh, resonances uh, are poles uh, of the S matrix in the complex plane, just like virtual states and just like bound states. Um, these are basically all so-called secret states. So they are solutions of the Schrodinger equation with the outgoing boundary conditions with a complex momentum. Um, so how do we find those states in the R matrix? Well, we look for those energies, complex energies, for which the matching condition uh, of the R matrix theory is satisfied. So those are our poles in the complex plane. Uh, now, there are other methods, of course, for localization of S matrix poles in secret states. Um, notably the exterior complex scaling, which has been used uh, um, to characterize, for example, the giant resonance in xenon. But to the best of my knowledge, there is no uh, really a method that uh, is available uh, for characterizing resonances in up initio calculations in multi-electron molecules. So the method that we use is actually a re-implementation of a theory that was developed uh, by Morgan and Burke already in 1988, but we have just uh, rediscovered it, so to speak, recently and re-implemented it into our molecular codes. So as an example of, uh, um, of what we can do, I'm showing you here uh, results of our calculations for electron scattering from HNCO molecule. So this molecule, we, we picked this molecule because it undergoes a process called dissociative electron attachment in which the electron comes, uh, it collides with the molecule, it attaches to resonance and then causes a breakup of the molecule. Uh, um, in a particular, it, it causes the extension of the NH bond which dissociates and then the electron is, is uh, attached um, to the fragment NCO. So here on the, on the panel in the top left, I'm showing you the calculated scattering cross-sections uh, as a function of energy and for all the different bond extensions. So what you can see is that the, uh, the resonance starts somewhere here at around 3 eV. It's, uh, it can be seen clearly in the cross-section, but as the bond is stretched, it actually disappears in the continuum. And you cannot see it anymore in the cross-sections. Um, so we wouldn't be able to characterize this resonance at all. But if we look into the complex plane, which, is, uh, which are the plots below. So in, in the plot uh, lower left, you see the complex energy plane. And in the lower right, you see the equivalent picture in the complex momentum plane. Well, if you analyze it, you see that the resonance uh, as a function of the bond length, it indeed uh, moves down in energy as the cross-section indicates and it wind widens, but it doesn't disappear. It doesn't become a bound state. In, instead, it converges to some point in the complex plane. Um, on the other hand, what we also see is that there is a virtual state in, in the system. And indeed, it's supported by the fact that the cross-section uh, is at the threshold is strongly enhanced, and then it goes down as well. Um, so with this method, we are now able to completely dissect the results of our calculations and interpret them in terms of resonances, virtual states, and so forth. Um, so now I can move on to the um, description of the molecular uh, uh, R matrix with time, uh, which is a uh, method that solves the time dependent Schrodinger equation for a multi electron molecule, uh, which is described using multicenter formalism and is embedded in the external field. And as described yesterday by Andrew, uh, the uh, method is implemented by an extension of the atomic RMT code developed originally at Queen's University of Belfast. 
And how the method works, uh, uh, just briefly, uh, by expanding the full wave function of the system in the inner region in, in the basis of multi-electron states, and in the outer region uh, into uh, basically single electron continua that are coupled to the ionic states. Um, so the inner and the outer region uh, must have a small overlap in order to allow for uh, the transfer of probability flux between the two regions. Um, and we have a, uh, a paper that describes the implementation in detail uh, that, was, that came out just this year. So the RMT um, can handle arbitrary time-dependent field, uh, which can have an arbitrary pol uh, polarization, including electrical. The input for the code is provided by the stationary code, the time-independent one, UKRMO plus, and the input consists of the dipole matrices between the inner region multi-electron states and uh, of the multiple potentials for the outer region calculation. Um, you can see in the picture on the right hand side the uh, structure of the Hamiltonian matrix in the inner region, which is pretty complex in the most general case, but uh, how the matrix actually looks like uh, for each case depends on the polarization that you choose. Um, I would like to emphasize again that in the R matrix method, we can uh, use a, an accurate description of the target uh, by, you know, standard quantum chemistry methods like uh, complete active space and full CI. And uh, we also have uh, the multicenter uh, description of the molecule in terms of standard uh, Gaussian basis. And for the continuum, we can use now uh, even B spline continuum or any combination of standard Gaussian continuum. Uh, the codes are uh, freely available on Zenodo, uh, so you can download them and, and use them. Um, so, as the first application of the codes, uh, we have chosen to look at uh, the below threshold ionization of H2. So, when we are in the Two photon regime, we are at low intensities, 10 to 9 watts per square centimeter. We chose linear polarization uh, uh, along the, the z axis, and we used an R matrix radius of 30 atomic units, so 30 bore. And uh, because H2 is a small molecule, we could afford to use a full CI description of the system. So in the inner region, we have a full CI expansion of the n plus 1 electron wave function. And uh, we use one electron, two different types of one electron bases for the, for the target. So these are all diffuse uh, basis sets. And on the right hand side, you see the two photon per sections. So these are, uh, there are some reference calculations of Morales et al from 2009. That's the dashed curve. And then we see the UKR mole results. Uh, so the time, time dependent ones are the RMT and these are, so these are the circles. And the point about these uh, two photon calculations is that if you want to get the cross-section accurate, uh, you really need to use uh, a very, very long pulse. And uh, just to make sure that the pulse is monochromatic uh, as it should be. Um, so for the RMT calculations, this translated to basically tens of thousands of core hours per single photon energy. So each of those points is a result of such a massive calculation. Um, however, for the same uh, calculation, we could also employ, employ perturbation theory, of course. So perturbation theory is orders of magnitude uh, uh, faster. And so these are the lines, the solid lines here. And you can see that the calculation with the, the largest basis set for the target indeed agrees very nicely with the reference calculations and the RMT calculations agree to, only they are much more expensive. So we are convinced that everything is working fine. And so now we can move on to uh, the uh, other application. So we move to from below threshold ionization to above threshold ionization. So the uh, cool application of, of this is of course uh, the rabbit uh, process. And uh, we were studying uh, the time delays in molecules uh, with our um, computational techniques. Now, just a brief summary. We know that in atomic systems, uh, it is possible to separate accurately the, uh, the rabbit time delay into two components. 
One is the continuum continuum, universal time delay, and the second one is the uh, Wigner-Smith uh, time delay. In molecular systems, things get a bit more tricky. Uh, you can still make this uh, separation into this universal continuum continuum delay and a molecular one, only the molecular time delay is no longer uh, Wigner-Smith time delay. Now, the uh, reason why we started looking at, at Rabbit, one of the reasons is that uh, because we do up initial calculations, we are interested in, in doing things uh, accurately. And behind all of these uh, theories of time delays is uh, the use of the so-called asymptotic approximation. So you cannot be entirely sure um, how accurate these separations are in, in the uh, various um, regimes of, of doing rabbit. Um, there is no stationary uh, benchmark that would uh, really uh, be able to calculate those time delays without the approximations that are normally used. Of course, you can do the time dependent calculations, which we, which we did as well, but those are very expensive, as I think I convinced you before. Um, and uh, the results also depend on the pulse parameters because uh, depending on how strong uh, a laser you use, you can also introduce other effects uh, into the uh, problem other than just uh, the simple uh, two photon interference that's here upon which the rabbit is based. Okay, nevertheless, in the first uh, step, uh, what we did is we took our um, RMT, uh, um, RMT codes and we looked at the rabbit delays in H2. And we looked at uh, two uh, polarizations of the laser with respect to the molecular axis. And we were always detecting electrons in the direction uh, parallel to the laser polarization. So the rapid delays are for those um, uh, directions. And uh, of course, since those were time dependent calculations, the delays were obtained by, by fitting the, the, the sideband to the uh, general cosine form. Um, and we used uh, the pulse, uh, the laser pulse from uh, calculations of Serov and Kaifetz. We used uh, a different approach. They used uh, a DFT approach. Uh, so the first calculations that we did were very simple. They, they used the Hartree-Fock uh, model and I'm showing you the results here. So the blue is the RMT result and the red and, and the green are the two different calculations from Serov and Kaifetz. So that's the parallel polarization. You see the peak here, and the peak is also displayed by the standard linear time delay. In the perpendicular polarization, nothing really interesting happens. You just have this smooth behavior. Now, we can also do much bigger calculations. We can do the full CI model for H2. And now we see that our RMT calculations, which is the blue curve again, uh, are now in very good agreement with the calculations of DFT. So the peak has shifted by 20 EV uh, by going from the static model to a model that incorporates the polarization fully. So we see that the rabbit delays are very sensitive to the dynamical polarization of the target. Now, as I promised, we can do now exact two photon matrix elements using the R matrix. So I'm not going to go into the derivation uh, very much. Um, I'll just tell you that briefly how we do it is by we compute the second order matrix element as the matrix element between the intermediate state that is generated after the absorption of the XUV photon and the final state, uh, which is uh, corresponds to the absorption of the, the RI photon. And we use uh, the, we know that this state satisfies uh, outgoing wave boundary conditions and we can ef efficiently implement those, implement those in, in uh, using the R matrix approach. Um, so first, as a first test, we, we applied those calculations to atomic hydrogen and we calculated rabbit delays there. And so we know that those can be calculated basically very efficiently. So the blue curve is the R matrix result uh, using the exact second order matrix element. The black dots are numerical results of Blunder so these come from time dependent calculations and the uh, red curve is, is uh, based on this approximate separation of between the Wigner, uh, Wigner delay and the continuum continuum delay. 
So you see that the exact two photon matrix elements are smooth all the way to up to the threshold um, and are in great agreement with the numerical calculations. Uh, and of course the approximate uh, treatment at some point breaks down but works very well up until low energies. Now we can apply this uh, uh, formalism to hydrogen molecule again and we look at the parallel uh, um, uh, results which are the more interesting ones and we can see that uh, the uh, second order matrix elements which is the blue curve uh, agrees very well with the RMT calculations which is the, the dashed black curve and there are also plotted some other um, approximate treatments which are based on the separation uh, between the continuum continuum and the bigner smith delay so we can see that the uh, se the, the separation into the uh, laser induced and the bigner smith delay is reliable from the 30 uh, electron from the pho photon energy of 30 electrons and, and above so we can use the separation to interpret this delay, which actually comes from the uh, Wigner-Smith delay. And if we look at the photonization cross-section for electron emission along the axis here, then we see that around the energy where the peak appears, the cross-section is perfectly flat, but the Wigner-Smith delay displays this peak. And it actually can be seen that it comes from the interference between the two partial waves. Uh, in the continuum, so L equal one and L equal three. And the fact that those uh, interferences arise is a, comes from the fact that the target is non-spherical. So in hydrogen, you would not have this kind of interference, right? Because you go from the S state into the P state. Uh, but in hydrogen, you have higher multiples of, of the charge density. And that's why you get those contributions here, those interferences. So we can see that the peak here in the time delay actually actually maps the non-spherical nature of the target. And as I said before, the peak position uh, is sensitivity to the dynamical polarization. Um, so if you want to like to learn more, you can, uh, you can have a look at the poster of Jakub Benda or contact him directly and he'll be very happy to give you more details on all the calculations of the two photon matrix elements and so forth. He did an excellent job. Uh, so the last part of the talk, in the last part of the talk, I would like to talk about strong field ionization of H2O, where we looked at the role of electron correlation. So this was our goal. We wanted to see how the channel coupling uh, and the correlation in the system is reflected in the uh, ionization yields. So we were calculating polarization dependent yields and we uh, used, um, you know, we used a simple description of the ionic states in this case, because the calculations are very demanding. So we included three ionic states. We included, of course, the ionic, ionic ground states and the two excited states. And we looked at uh, two different uh, modes of the calculation and uncoupled one in which there, the coupling between the states is forbidden. Uh, so in this case, you see that the ionization yields, uh, polarization dependent ionization yields, they very well, they reflect exactly the shape of each of the uh, Dyson orbitals from which the ionization starts. But in the coupled case, the um, shapes of the orbitals, they always reflect the shape of the HOMO. So the, uh, so the inherent uh, uh, shape of the Dyson orbitals is suppressed and the HOMO prevails. Um, so these calculations were done at, a, I'm just remarking here that the calculations were done at this relatively low intensity uh, that will be interesting for what's to follow. Um, but uh, we can look at the results in uh, greater detail. So these are the cuts through the uh, ionization yields through the different planes of the molecule. And we can compare the coupled results, which are the, the solid curves here for the, two for the three different orbitals and compare them against the reference calculations of Petretti who use DFT and that corresponds to the uncoupled case. Uh, so here you can see that indeed the, the shape of, uh, of, the of the ionization yields, it, it re reflects the shape of the HOMO. For the uncoupled case, our calculations are in very good qualitative agreement with the Petretti uh, calculations. And as uh, we identified in our calculations, actually the reason why the shape of the HOMO dominates is through electron correlation. And we did this by switching off the 
uh, laser-induced uh, couplings in the ion. So we know that it cannot happen that uh, that you basically will have transitions in the in the ion uh, due to the absorption of the laser. So we have two more minutes. Yes. So what we think is happening is that you start with the ionization into the the ground state, and then uh, the electron is in the continuum. But of course, because of electron correlation, the electron can scatter from the ion and, and excite it electronically. So that way the electron is leaving the molecule uh, excited. Um, or what can also happen is that the, the electron can absorb uh, a photon and that can also enhance the electronic excitation. So these results that I've showed you will be published uh, hopefully soon in, in a paper uh, uh, by Jakub. And so the picture gets even more interesting when you do uh, the scans of the polarization dependent yields as a function of intensity. So what we see is that the yields for uh, the laser um, uh, polarized along the, the z-axis um, actually start to overtake the uh, yields uh, for uh, when the laser is polarized along the x-axis as the as the intensity is increased. So, and actually at high intensities, the yields start to resemble more the uncoupled case. So that's interesting. That's to showing us that at lower intensities, electron correlation is more important than at the higher intensities. And the, uh, we interpret those results as, uh, as uh, basically going from below, below barrier ionization into above barrier ionization regime. Um, and that ties well with uh, some predictions of Yagao, who was studying the uh, role of uh, below barrier and above barrier ionization in static field calculations. So finally, I would like to thank the, uh, all the collaborators uh, whose work was essential for uh, all this work to happen. Uh, most of the results presented here were uh, obtained by Jakub Benda, who did a, a great job. Um, so finally, I would like to conclude just by saying that we can uh, characterize all resonance states in our, our matrix uh, time independent calculations, that we have developed a multi-electron um, RMT approach for polyatomic molecules. We are able to calculate exact two photon matrix elements that can assist uh, the analysis of uh, rapid time delays in molecules. And we have shown that correlation and channel coupling are crucial for to obtain accurate picture of strong field ionization at uh, uh, low intensities. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. Uh, I uh, I'm looking if we have some questions. Yes, uh, a question from Andrew Brown. Uh, can you explain a little more how you are characterizing the nature of each point in your complex energy and momentum plots? Um, okay, um, so it's somewhat more complicated uh, how, how we characterize it. Well, what we can do is that we can first identify the uh, pole in the complex energy plane, and then we can uh, basically compute the, the exact resonant wave function at that energy, at that complex energy. So we can obtain, uh, for example, the expansion of the resonant wave functions uh, in terms of the inner region R metric states. And we can also do other things with it, like if we project these n plus one resonant wave functions onto the channel, uh, like the target wave functions, we can obtain exactly the complex resonant orbitals, for example. Um, and we can do other things with it potentially uh, in the future, like we can, for example, remove uh, completely some uh, poles that correspond to resonances from RS matrices. So we can calculate everything as is, but then only remove the pole whose uh, basically role we want to understand. So we can do that straightforwardly by uh, contour integration in the complex plane. That's a work in progress, not something that we have implemented. Uh, okay, thank you. I do not see any more questions. So thank you again for this, uh, this nice presentation.
Thank you. And uh, let's move to our last uh, uh, speaker. Our last speaker is uh, Federico uh, Marquesin, and uh, he will talk about uh, atomistic simulation advanced platform. Hi, good morning. Hi, can you turn on your uh, camera? Yeah, I'm having some technical problems. Oh. Uh, before it was working. Well, uh, if not, maybe you can share your screen. So you can see my screen, correct? Uh, yes, we see your presentation and uh, you can put now. Okay, it, it's okay. Thank okay, you. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I'm sorry for these <laughs> camera issues. Uh, so uh, my name is uh, Federico Marquezine and um, well, I work in Simune. Um, and well, I'd like to thank the um, organizer in order to uh, give me the opportunity, possibility to uh, talk here about um, the company, Simone, and what we are doing in this company and which kind of software we are developing in. Uh, so this talk is going to be very different from the previous one because it's not going to be a scientific talk, but rather, as I said, I will present our company and what we do. So um, Simone, uh, we are in um, San Sebastian, Spain and was first launched in 2014 as a joint venture of scientific expert and, and developers of uh, Siesta and Ant. Um, those are uh, Professor Emilio Artacho, Professor Pablo de Hon, and Jose Soler, and those are the Siesta expert and developers. And then there is uh, Juan Jose Palacios, that's the main developer of, of Ant. And so uh, with these four people, we started the company in 2014. Um, our team, uh, we are currently uh, seven people. Uh, we have our uh, CEO, Daniel Simo. Um, all the rest, we are basically, we all have a scientific background. Um, um, there is also, we have also a PhD student that's enrolled in uh, Toucha Project project in which we are involved to. And on top of it, we always have uh, students that um, for, they come here and they work with us for a few months, like they do internships, and uh, um, to help us in our, in our work. Uh, we also have a um, very nice scientific network. Those are some of the people in our scientific network, I'd like to um, mention Professor Fernando Martin, that you all know, and uh, Nick Papior, that's currently one of the main developers of SESTA and the tool TransSESTA, calculating transport properties, and Daniel Sanchez Portal and Javier Junquera, who uh, are two of the uh, main uh, SESTA uh, developers. And those are the people that uh, we can uh, count on every time uh, if we need help or if we, if we want to start a new collaboration. So what we do in Simune? Uh, Simune is a company that's expert in atomistic simulation. This means that we offer services to industry, but also to academia. And uh, on one side, we offer professional support for Siesta and also other code. Uh, mainly for Siesta, Siesta, as you understood, is our uh, flagship code. And uh, professional supports include um, training, um, webinar, tutorials, and so on and so forth. Basically, to teach researchers in the, to properly use uh, Siesta and efficiently. We also have a service of more general consultancy for uh, material design. 
Uh, in this case, we basically plan a workflow starting from scratch. So if there is a customer interested to a particular simulation, we plan it from scratch and we make use, we make use also other code, not only SESTA. Uh, exactly, depending on what the customer wants, we plan the simulation accordingly. <clears throat> and these are for industry, but also for um, the academia. On the other side, we have what we call a Simunes Code Support Program. Um, so uh, in this program, what we do is to try to identify open source code that we think are interesting and powerful and uh, help them, if you want, create some ready to use tools uh, with, for which we also provide support and, and, and we, we guarantee for it, basically. Um, this uh, might include also, for example, promoting them, distributing them, and, and enlarge the community that's using them, for example. Uh, we have been doing this fruitfully, and we are still doing it for uh, SESTA, ANT, and XCAM. Um, and um, SESTA um, is a DFT code, you might, you should, might know it, and ANT is a transport code that coupled with Gaussian, and you all know XCAM. Um, anyway, we'll come back later about it. Um, among our product, we have some uh, SESTA-related um, product, uh, such as uh, executable for Windows and SESTA Docker. It might sound weird, um, it was weird for me as well at the beginning because I was always used coming from like a scientific background of running uh, this kind of codes in a Linux, Unix environment. But uh, we, have, we had a lot of customers asking for SESTA for Windows. Um, moreover, we use the Docker technology in order to create any kind of binary, so pre-compiled version of Siesta such that the user, so that the user doesn't have to do anything for any uh, kind of uh, environment, including um, servers. Uh, we have also pseudo potentials and basis set. Uh, you will know about pseudo potentials and basis set, how important they are in fundamental for uh, running a calculation and for it to be accurate. And we, uh, along the years, we, we design a procedure and we optimize set of potential and basis set uh, for system, for our customers, and not only. Um, we also have tutorials that teach users um, to, to start using SESTA and to learn how to do even uh, more, um, even complex things. And finally, our main product, although it's at the bottom of our slide, is, is um, Atomistic Simulation Advanced Platform, so uh, our software uh, as up. Uh, I will talk later more about it. So, uh, we are also involved as a company in uh, many research and training programs, and here uh, I'm gonna mention just uh, some of those that might be um, important. So in Reto Collaboration, we uh, assist a pro project. Uh, we were involved in development of SESTA related tools. Uh, we um, were working together with three uh, groups of developers of SESTA. And just to mention something, the possibility of running SESTA with hybrid um, functional, this is something that has been implemented in this project. And uh, the GUI that we started implemented uh, for this project now is what is called ASAP. Then uh, we are involved in this in a project called Tocha uh, for studying basically topological devices, and we have a PhD student working on it. In 2017, we uh, collaborated with Professor Fernando Martin. We made a market analysis uh, for XCAM uh, within the ERC proof of concept uh, grant. And fol the following years, we got the SME instrument um, phase one. Uh, 
um, for basically the advanced atomistic scale simulation solution, so ASAP. Uh, then, as you know, we are in these atom second chemistry cost actions. And uh, as last but not least, let me get there. Uh, we 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 still collaborating with uh, Professor Fernando Martin in and uh, we join our effort in order to uh, create what we call a module photoion that's basically um, kind of a module for us up to um, run um, basically um, XCAM uh, calculation that can be done with the XCAM package. So those are just some of our programs that in which we are involved. And just to give you a flavor of what, what we are doing in this company, uh, apart from like offering services and uh, developing our tools. Um, what is our mission? Um, our mission is to bridge uh, these two worlds that might seem very far away, so the academia and the industry. Uh, in academia, we have, and we have collaborations with MIT, with the Max Center of Excellence, um, Siesta, obviously, um, developers and community with the SICAM and with Nanoguna. Among industrial partners, here I just put two. One is Merck and the other is JSOL. I'd like to talk about JSOL because JSOL is, a, um, is, a, is our collaborator from Japan and distributor. We've been working with, with this JSOL uh, already for a few years in a fruitful way. Um, JSOL is a big company in Japan uh, selling software. Uh, their software is uh, JOCTA and is a multi uh, scale simulation uh, platform. And uh, for atomistic calculation, uh, for uh, yeah, atomistic scale calculation and first principle calculation, they are using Shesta. And that's where we are helping them and support them with clients and customers. But that's not it. Two years ago, we developed something called a uh, system interfacial tool, always within their uh, code. Um, it's a small tool in this case uh, to calculate the energy, basically the interaction energy between surface and molecule. And one of the purpose is then to extract uh, energy potential for um, classical molecular dynamics simulations. So this is always is, is, a, is, a, is a tool that is already available uh, within their software. Uh, but that's not it. As we speak <laughs> this, this, this week, they are um, launching the JOCTA uh, 6.1, the version 6.1, that, that includes um, what is called a system modeler, that's um, the ASAP version for JOCTA. So everything I will be talking to you later on about ASAP Will, uh, is included in, in, in this um, tool called System Modeler that, that will be um, sold in Japan as part of a JOCTA um, code. Um, before moving to and talk about the software as app, uh, something that I would like to talk about is some industrial application because it, even for me at the beginning it was difficult to understand how can uh, something that's been developed mainly for basic research be uh, so important and powerful and interesting for industrial uh, customers. And I just give you three examples. For example, coating. Coating is used for everything, everything that is anti basically, antibacterial, anti-sticky, anti-static, everything. And, and, and this can be studied uh, with, with simulations because it's basically interaction between surfaces and molecules, surface, surface and another substrate. You can also get optical properties out of the substrate. And this is the, all the this information that are coming from simulations uh, are very useful and important for the, for the academic, for the industry. industry. Another uh, topic is batteries. Uh, now more than ever, people are putting a lot of effort into batteries and uh, reaction happening to batteries, evolution of CEI inside batteries, those things can be uh, studied with simulations. So it's very appealing for industry to have tools that are able to do that. And finally, 
uh, it's quite interesting to, to, to know that even metafabrication such as welding, that seems to be like a well-known and like, <laughs> uh, technique. Well, the characterized crystallization processes that are happening, okay, a high temperature when these two metals melt together, well, is quite important. And those are information that you cannot get with any other tool. And then we enter in the realm of uh, nanofluidics and all this. Uh, so I just wanted to show you, to show this slide to you, to give you a, an, uh, an idea of what, uh, what kind of, uh, what the indu industry is looking for, what the industry is expecting from us. Okay, so this first part, I conclude this first part of my talk with this brief introduction about um, uh, Simone. So let's move on and talk about um, uh, our software. So um, if I put myself on a, uh, as, as on the customer side, I see that commercial, existing commercial software are expensive and usually customer support uh, takes place without direct connection uh, to the developers. And on the other side, they have open source code that are really powerful, but not so, so user friendly. And we know customer support often. So what we do, what we do is try to create something that is like is a commercial software, but uh, by using open source code and, and by having a direct connection with the developers can provide what actual commercial software cannot. So the benefit provided by Zao would be a user-friendly platform with a graphical user interface. Uh, then uh, we also create modules and packages. I will talk later about this. Uh, specifically for um, targeting um, specific industrial issue, let's say. And it integrates uh, open source code and we provide customer support. And these two last points are basically what we are trying to do, bridging academia with industry. Uh, <clears throat> as I said, our software has a graphical user interface. Here you can see a screenshot of um, our software and uh, is already to use uh, code, so installation is trivial. Uh, can be used in Linux, Mac, Mac OS, and Windows 10. Uh, makes use of uh, engines such as, or code such as Siesta and in the future, uh, XCAM. Um, is not included in a ZAP. Um, a ZAP uh, talk with such code, interacts with such code in order to uh, send calculation and retrieve data. So um, a ZAP is installed on your local PC and Siesta, for example, can be installed anywhere in the world in any server. And so you can, you, you can have all the uh, compute power, the power you, you need, all the CPUs you need to perform your calculation. <clears throat> so these two product, these two things are different. It's very important to know this, that one thing is Siesta and one thing is a ZAP. And in the future, we want to, have, to add more of these engines so the Siesta can, and ASAP can the, as a user, can decide if he wants to calculate uh, something with Siesta, XCAM, Abinit, or whatever. Um, in order to do so, to make it like um, easy to use, user friendly, with an appealing graphical user interface, we uh, design a workflow. They start from the a structure builder on viewer. Then uh, with the project, you decide what kind of calculation and properties you want to calculate. You set up the calculator. In this case, uh, we have basically Siesta and all the parameters. And then you decide where you want to run it. And after, if your calculation finished, you can analyze the results. So we have also post-processing suite, suite so that you don't have to deal with scripts and terminal. And this is our project workflow. Um, let me tell you that um, at currently uh, we have, um, we can perform calculations like single point calculation, question of state calculation, geometry optimization, and uh, nudge elastic man calculation, vibration and phonon. Um, Nudge elastic band calculations is for um, characterizing reactions, so energy to out of 
for example, you can um, characterize diffusion of atoms on a surface or um, chemical reactions. Then vibrations of, for molecules and phonons for uh, bulk systems. Um, okay, let me keep this skip this slide. Uh, maybe I'll come back later if I have um, time. <clears throat> And our um, ASAP will be released in three versions. Uh, one is as a pro, already available. Uh, we start a structure modeling tool, so pre-processing tool, an analy analysis suite for post-processing, and with different modules and project. Under development is what we call as a pro plus with an additional uh, calculator slash modules slash packages on purchase. Um, I will show you in a moment what I mean with packages. We also have uh, an undergoing development for uh, designing ASAP Edu for teaching with obviously reduced functionalities and um, is a web interface in this case. Um, <clears throat> before I mention about as a pro and packages, what are those packages that goes on top of the already existing as a pro uh, software? Uh, those are packages designed for tackling specific um, industrial problems to characterize uh, processes such as catalytic process. And these are uh, the first module that we call uh, ChemCata. Then we have another modules. Uh, these are all things that are under development, so they are not available yet. We will release um, probably as a pro plus with some of those packages by the end of uh, next year. Then there is a module for transport, for characterizing um, well, transport in uh, molecules or uh, injunctions. And we will make use of Transista for doing so. We also decided to have to move at different scales, so to use some classical MD and in our semi semi S uh, package. And then we also um, are, the, are adding some, um, let's say, the possibility of doing some docking simulation and finite element method uh, simulation to solve problems that are. Um, like heat transfer, fluid flow, and structure analysis, and they are very important in engineering. So uh, with these packages that goes on top of ASA Pro, we basically want also to uh, do something more than uh, ab initio cannot do. Um, this is um, just, well, I'm not going through all of it, but um, this is, for example, a detailed uh, specification of what a transport package will do. I like also, I have to mention that uh, in collaboration with uh, Fernando Martin, we are um, developing, uh, we already started this uh, module photo ion. Uh, basically to have the possibility of do what XCAM can do now, but within um, ASAP, within a module of ASAP that we decided to call photo ion. And uh, this will be, uh, well, will be um, a powerful tool with a graphical user interface. So doing a calculation with XCAM will be, uh, will be done in the same way in which basically now we are able with us up to perform a calculation with Siesta. Um, then I basically finished my time and I also uh, finished my presentation. Um, please visit our webpage. Uh, we have more information about what we do and about ASAP. Um, we also have a forum. Um, this is, is a forum that is a Siesta, Simone Siesta forum, but it's not going to be limited only to Siesta. So user that um, register in our website for free, obviously there's this nothing going on below. You can, you, you can, um, you can write it, you can, open a discussion in our forum. Of course, our forum is available anyway, but if you want to participate, to write things, you need to be um, registered. 
So with this, I think I, I, I finished and I'd like to thank you for your attention. And just one thing, as you saw, um, and I hope you got this message from my talk, we are uh, always open uh, to collaborate with uh, um, academic groups. Uh, we are always open to start collaboration that could lead to the development, for example, of a new tool or to improve an existing tool. Obviously, we are not, um, as you see, as, as we are doing with CST and, and XCAM, we are collaborating. One important thing that I want to stress out, CESTA is not ours. CESTA still is a GPL code, so we, don't, we, we respect that. We are just connecting our tools so that user can uh, use uh, CESTA, such a powerful tool, but in a more user-friendly way. And so this is very important, especially uh, for industry. So I think it's 25 past one. So with this, I concluded. And thanks for your attention once more. Well, uh, thank you for this. Uh interesting uh, presentation. Let's check if uh, we have some uh, questions. I, uh, I do not see uh, any questions uh, at the moment. Okay, uh, I, I have a question. Uh, you said that uh, uh, your, uh, one of your tasks is to link uh, basic research with the uh, industry. That is a, a very uh, important uh, uh, task in my opinion. But uh, uh, till now, uh, do you have some industrial customers? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, we have some contact with industrial customers um, for, um, directly and not only directly. So we, what we are looking for uh, at the moment, um, also because uh, we have like we are such a relatively small company, is to, um, to have distributors such as um, JSOL. So we work with, for example, with them, we've been working with customers as big as Daihatsu, for example, on Toyota, um, through them. Okay, so it's, um, it's basic and the same, uh, we are doing the same in India, where we have a, a distributor with uh, Indian customers. Then in each country, obviously, it's different, the way you approach clients. And um, so uh, we have also some direct uh, contact with some um, like European uh, customers, but it's true that uh, what we've been done so far has been particularly fruitful in Japan, for example. In Japan, definitely we had uh, many customers and, um, and that was, yeah, this is what we've been, we've been, we've been devoting a lot of effort in that, in that direction, for example. And uh, so I hope I answer to your question, let's say. But th there, are, there are definitely customers, uh, uh, we need to be appealing for them, definitely, because um, big companies might already have their tools that they are using, so we need to be competitive. While small, most small company might not be aware of the uh, benefit of, of simulations, so we need to go in both directions. Okay, thank you. So uh, uh, this uh, session uh, 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 comes to the uh, end. So uh, I uh, will close this uh, session, but uh, not before thanking again to all the four uh, speakers who have given very interesting talks and uh, I remind you that uh, after the break, the next, next session starts at uh, 15 past uh, uh, 10 Central European time. So see you later.